Okay, we're going to get into hermeneutics. This is our second class on the letters, part two. Um, so we'll be going through some shorter chunks of scripture. Uh, so before we do that, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us together today by your sovereign hand as we come to learn more um, and dig into the study of Scripture, how to study faithfully and come to your word in a submissive way to uh, receive and to believe what you have said. And so help us in that endeavor today to learn more about the study of Scripture um, help us unpack um, various things to look for so that we are more attentive to your word and how you have given it through men to write what you intended to write. So minister to our hearts by your grace alone for the glory of Christ, and we pray this in his glorious name. Amen. Okay, so again, we're going to get into uh, the second part of letters, going to get into maybe a little more of detail um, in some passages, we'll hopefully, time permitting, we'll go through three different passages. Um, but I wanted to start off a little bit um, and kind of uh, talk about some of the needs and then also my own process in, uh, in sermon prep. So uh, to start with, uh, the need is that we need to know what God says. This is God's word. So we, do not, we, we try our very hardest to not go to it with our own perceptions, our own presuppositions, and read into the text what we want the text to say. We need to come from a submissive standpoint to obey the Lord Jesus Christ and the word that God has given us and to come and see what God has said for us. And so we need to do that to know what God has said so that we can live a life glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ and being tools for him, for his glory, as we abide in what God has said, as we continue on growing in our understanding of it, growing in um, changing our mind when we are wrong, um, all of the activities of life in Christ uh, in studying his, his word. So... It's so important to have a foundation that this is God's word. We need to have uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 engraved in our minds every time we come to scripture, knowing that it is breathed out by God and it's for his use to change us, to transform us and to bring us into conformity to his will. And so that calls us as sinners to be obedient to what he says. Um, and so uh, in a, a very vital part of that is uh, knowing the historical context of what we're, write, uh, what we're reading. It was written thousands of years ago in different contexts that we're in today. And so we need to endeavor as much as we can to know the whole context of when, what it was written in who it was written to, why it was written, what was going on in those times, uh, what were the vital issues that were playing in the, the reason of why it was written to those people. All of what we've talked about before in the, in the book goes through that, um, of knowing the importance of the historical context. That, that gives us a foundation and a balance that we can then look at what God has said and then, and then venture on how we are to apply it faithfully to us today, which is a, it's a bridge that's hard to, to, to bridge across, being so far removed from that time period. And so we need to really endeavor to do that. So um, in, in doing that and being very mindful of the historical context, then that helps us figure out more and more what the author's points are. Uh, what they're getting across, what are the theological issues that they are uh, writing in light of, what, what's driving them, like Jude, he's, he, he's wanting to write about something, but he's so compelled to write about something else. Why? What, were, what was going on in that time period? Um, so that helps us follow along with what the, the author is, in, in, is writing. And ultimately, you know, God is using those men to write what he intended to write. And so, again, it's God's word, and we need to figure out what his intended meaning is first. That's foundational. Um, so in with these letters, uh, these letters have massive theological implications on life. Uh, they delve into uh, great gospel truths and, and implications on life. 
and they're embedded in the contexts of who they're writing to. And so they're affecting the lives of people that they're writing to. And it's deep, theologically rich. Um, a lot of the letters start in a very doctrinal way, as, as, as Jonathan talked about, and then goes into a great uh, time of application. And so we need to see that structure. We need to see it for what it is uh, in our life, how our beliefs, what we believe about the gospel, about salvation, about Christ, uh, is rooted in, in, in how we behave, what we do, how we live life. Um, and so that has to be on our minds. Um, and so we are to submit, to receive, and believe God's truth in Christ. And we are to endeavor in a lifelong endeavor to, to, to know what God has said. And it's such a glorious, uh, just a, a great journey to come to this word, knowing it's alive and knowing that God ministers to us through his word and, and coming to see what God has said. And by his spirit, we come to understand it. Uh, we grow in our understanding, grow in our conviction of what he says, and we stand on that truth more and more. So as we study scripture, Studying and in, in reflecting and sitting on it, meditating on it, uh, taking our time with it, it's when we really commune with God and to where we fellowship with him to respond to what he says. We will respond to what God says no matter what. The question is, is that response in obedience, in love to the Lord Jesus Christ by the grace of God, or are we continually pushing against what he says in order to achieve what we want, what we believe, what our opinions are. And so that is an endeavor to commune with God himself in the study of Scripture. And so uh, my process in, in, uh, in preparing for sermons oftentimes is to read the text that I'm, that I'm going to preach on and to pray and to pray all the way through this whole process, but to read to sit with it, to meditate on it, reflect on it, study, break it down into the words, into the phrases, into all those things, and hopefully we'll get a glimpse of that today. Uh, but to just sit with it for a while. Read it over and over and over and over again. And then try to go away from that text and have that same thing in your mind of what you read and just sit with it, reflect on it in your daily life. Keep it with you. Um, and and we, we like to marinate meat in, in great marinades. We need to marinate in God's truth. We need to sit in it and reflect on it and pray all the way through that if uh, we aren't coming to understand something or it's a little harder to understand, God, help me with this. I want to know you more. I want to know what you have said. I want to glorify you in my life. So please help me understand this truth. Help me search the scriptures knowing that as scripture interprets scripture so that I find out what you are saying in your word so that I can live more of a glorifying life for you. Um, and so uh, this whole process of read, sit with it, reflect, study, it takes time. It takes great time. And in that, if we're studying a, a short passage, we need to remember that it's in a greater context. Context has to be ingrained in our mind that we need to read Scripture in context, not just in the chapter, not just in the unit of thought, but in the rest of the whole book and the rest of all of Scripture. We need to keep that because it's so often nowadays, and, and, and this is one of the downfalls, I think, of many devotional uh, situations is that we take a, a verse or two verses and we pull it out and we run with it. We don't keep it in context. We don't keep it in the context that God has given us. And so we need to remember that. We need to remember that there weren't chapter breaks in the original manuscripts. So when we get my example for this is um, at, the, at the end of John chapter 2, that goes right into John chapter 3. But if we are so ingrained in a kind of devotional mindset to where we just, we're just going to read chapter 2 and that's it, we miss it. We disconnect God's word. And so we need to do the unit of thought in context, and that needs to be feeding our study all the time, all the time. That helps us to be balanced. That help, helps us to be mindful of the foundation that we need to, to, to move from. And so take our time with it. When you study scripture, do not rush it. Do not rush it. And if you have to go, then come back to it. 
Don't just come and check it off the list and be like, okay, I'm done, and my mind's shut off. You need to keep it with you, and you need to come back to it if you can't immediately do it right then and there. But don't rush through it. It's, it's good to have um, those, those uh, you know, the, the calendars where you're reading through, you know, good regimen. That's so useful. But if we're so formulaic in our study of Scripture, we're missing it big time. We're missing communing with God himself through his word. And so we need to take our time. Don't feel like we have to rush through it. Let it sit with you. And as you think through the text, as you put all the historical context, literary context, other things that we'll go through that help us study, as you put that together and think about what is the writer intending to write, then as you get maybe an idea of what you think the text says, then go to commentaries. Then go and test your, your understanding on these things with a multi- multitude of contexts uh, from a, a lot of different uh, areas of study, um, even using multiple translations where you're using more of uh, a, a translation that sticks closer to the original language and then maybe one that's more contemporary. Uh, use multiple translations in your study time to help you decipher what God has said. And going in further, don't be afraid to go to the original languages. Don't be afraid to go to Hebrew, to Greek. Uh, There's tools, resources that can help you that are basic to just give you a basic understanding of words or or, uh, verse, verb tenses or other things like that that will magnify and deepen the truth of God for you. I guarantee it. If we take our time and we really want to study to know God and his truth, then God will bless our time, definitely. Um, So uh, in the email I sent, I sent a good quote, and it's from uh, Puritan Thomas Brooks. And he says this just as a reminder for us today. Remember that it is not hasty reading, but serious meditation on holy and heavenly truths that makes them prove sweet and profitable to the soul. It is not the mere touching of the flower by the bee that gathers honey, but her abiding for a time on the flower that draws out the sweet. It is not he that reads most, but he that meditates most that will prove to be the choicest, sweetest, wisest, and strongest Christian. There's so much truth to that, that we need to sit with God's word. We need, God, we need to ask God to, to pour it over ourselves, to, to wash us with his word um, and, and just sit with it. So uh, with that, we're going to get into some texts. Um, so go to 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1, and we're going to go through the first nine verses uh, f- somewhat fairly quickly as I'd like to get to a couple other texts. But I just wanted to point out some, uh, some specifics and, and walk through them, implications, uh, those types of things. And one, uh, one thing to be mindful of, especially as we go through this chunk in First Peter, is be aware of the purpose statements that drive us to understanding not only who God is, but what his work is, what he purposes to do in the lives of those that are his. And so there's tons of purpose statements that, that, that draw out the sovereignty of God. And I hope even in this study that if you are not sold on the sovereign grace of God and God's sovereignty in salvation in all of life, it's right here, right here staring us in the face, and we ought to see it for what it truly is. So uh, it begins right away, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, an apostle of Jesus Christ. This is in the genitive. Uh, If if you've studied uh, Monday nights, especially, I've I've harped on this a lot. Uh, The basic idea of genitive verb tense is that it's possessed by and comes from. And so uh, uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, the apostolic office is possessed by Christ and comes from him. And that actually gives us a, a, a good look into uh, the requirements of being an apostle, which we won't get into today specifically. But this apostolic office is possessed by Christ. It's originating from him, and, and it comes from him. He is the only one to give that uh, 
uh, uh, that ordination in the sense of that office of apostle. So this is Peter. He's an apostle of Jesus Christ, glorifying Christ as he is a servant to Christ. And then he goes on to those who are elect. Elect exiles of the dispersion of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, uh, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, he starts off with a word that we don't like. Anybody know what that word is? That word is elect. We often don't like that word. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. If he starts off right away with that word, and we're so confused on it today, do you think the people that he's writing to are confused on it? Is he going to use a word that they don't know? No. Why would he use a word that they wouldn't know? I don't think that would be a very good job well done. So he uses the word elect, and in 2 Peter 1.10, he even uses it again and says, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. So they're even intentionally supposed to confirm their calling and election. So if they don't know what election is rooted in the sovereignty of God, then they're ill-equipped to do that. They're not, being, they're not going to be able to do that. So he, right away, he's using a term that they know. And what's interesting, in a lot of the beginning of the letters, the sovereignty of God, the sovereign grace of God is right there. It's explained all throughout, over and over and over again. So I point that out just so that we are being mindful of the words being used. We're being mindful of what God is saying, the words that he's using that we should not stray from, that we should not gloss over, that we should think very hard at why is he using this word? What does it mean? Um, I think of propitiation in the NIV. It doesn't use that word. Why not? That is a glorious word that we should endeavor to look into what that actually means and not go away from these these theological words that we try to dumb down so much today. Use them in study of what they actually mean. So to those who are elect exiles, uh, and then he goes on to to name all the places. Now here again, the historical context, dig dig a little deeping, dig a little further in, in those places in your study. But then notice the purpose statement. For those who are elect exiles, according to. So they're elect according to what? According to God, specifically the foreknowledge of God. So the foreknowledge of God that God possesses, that it comes from him. And we need to, again, here's a word, a theological word that we just oftentimes, oh, I'm just going to read it and just keep going. What does it mean? What does foreknowledge mean? It's not that God looks down to the corridor of time and kind of learns what people would do. God knows what's going to happen because he's ordained it to happen. This knowledge is an intimate knowing of what is to happen. And in this case, these are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. They, he has set their love upon his, his love upon his people before time began. This is the very first steps of the the salvation that is going to be theirs that began before time began. So he sets his love upon his people, his elect. And this is clearly his purpose. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit. So again, it's rooting in God's activity, God's sovereign grace, and it's magnifying it, not just according to the purpose of God and the foreknowledge of him, but then in sanctification of the Spirit and separation by the Spirit for holy purposes set apart in Christ. And look again, for it's for a purpose. And he names two purposes of sanctification. What are they? For obedience to Jesus Christ. To live a holy, godly life under the lordship of Christ for all of life and for sprinkling with his blood, for cleansing of life. Notice, in the sanctification of the spirit, for obedience and for sprinkling. Those fours are back pointed to sanctification. They're explaining further what sanctification is. And this is a cleansing of life. So these are describing, he's describing in in a general way at the outset that this is the sanctification of the Spirit that ought to be a reality. And so he, he, he unfolds that. And so we have to, again, this is why we need to take time with Scripture. 
Because if we just gloss over it in the sanctification of the Spirit by, for obedience to Jesus Christ, for the sprinkling of blood, we just move on. But what does that actually mean? And how is Peter building upon what sanctification is? He's describing it more. He's explaining it more. And he's doing it for a reason. And he's getting into more of the reason here in a minute. But this is a typical, it, 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 more in detail, but this is a typical greeting of these letters. And then he goes into, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Typical greeting. And then here's, here's, here's a great chunk. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now as we go into these next verses, these next two, three verses, look at all the purpose statements. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You notice all the purpose statements that are residing in the purpose of God's grace for us? So we are not born again, but according to the mercy, his great mercy, his triumphant, magnifying, beautiful mercy. It's according to his mercy that we are born again. So being born again, is that something that we contribute to? Is that something that we try to achieve or we work with God and say, you know what, I won't make you born again until you say yes, until you act in a faith no. What does it plainly say? He has caused us. He's the one who causes it. He's the one who does it. He's the one who goes in a mysterious way and regenerates the heart, takes the heart of stone and replaces it with a heart of flesh. Who else can have a part in that? Nobody. Nobody has a part in their physical birth. So why would we think that we have a part in our, our spiritual birth? And so this, again, it's plain and simple, right here, right in front of us, and it's using language that we know. He has caused us to be born again, to be, for the purpose of bringing life to a dead soul, to a living hope. So it goes even further. It's not just that he caused us to be born again and then just kind of leaves us and just say, hey, good luck. No, he's to a living hope. So now that we're alive, we're abiding in a hope that has come to us because God has been merciful to us and it comes to us through the conduit of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So because he has risen from the grave, because God has vindicated his son, stamp of approval on what he has done, we then can come and have a living, abiding, loving hope in Christ. A hope. A hope is something that we can't see. A hope is something that we can't fully grasp. And so that hope is, is, is grounded and comes through the resurrection of Christ to us when he was raised from the dead. And notice it goes even further. So he has caused us to be born again, to live in a hope, a living hope that continues on, that doesn't stop, to an inheritance you see again the purpose statements, to an inheritance, an inheritance that it's, as he says later, that's kept for us. We'll get, that, get there in a second. But you notice the building. You notice how he keeps building upon his gracious work. We're just merely the recipients of it. He's the one who's doing all of this glorious work. And he's doing it to give us an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Now, those are three important words. Three important words that should just tell us right away that this hope cannot die, cannot fade away, and cannot be spoiled. It will not go anywhere. Why? Because it's not dependent upon us. Not dependent upon our good works, our keeping up, in our obedience, in any way we want to call it, no matter what it is. It's not dependent upon us. And so that very hope, that very inheritance, that very living hope, that very new life and that rebirth, according to the grace and mercy of God, will not go away. 
So we need to, again, the, the theological implications are massive. And they're massive to where they drive us to truth and life, implications for life. So this should ground us, and we'll get to this in a rejoicing, a rejoicing that is inexpressible. And so it's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. This inheritance, Peter says, is kept in heaven for you. Kept. So who keeps it? This whole passage so far is focused on God. God's grace in Christ. He's the one keeping it. He's the one holding it secure. Where? In heaven. For who? For God's elect. For those that he set apart in Christ. When did that happen? Before the foundation of the world in his foreknowledge. You see the magnifying of his grace that secures us in Christ? And this is all because as he's writing this, he's writing this to believers who are going through and will go through persecution. They will go through hard, hard times. So they need an anchor to walk in life. They need a foundation, a rock-solid foundation that they can move from, that that foundation is immovable when they feel like they are shaking. So they need this reiteration of this beautiful gospel truth that they need to live upon, actively live upon. And so this inheritance is kept in heaven for them, for you, by sovereign grace alone. And then he goes on, verse 5, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So who by God's power are being guarded through faith? So here's the question. How does Peter define faith? Is it something that we do? Something that we work with God in doing? Something that we kind of take something that God's given us and a little bit of grace to just kind of jumpstart us, but then it's on us to keep it going or to even utilize that in the first place? No, who by, again, purpose statement driven to the grace of God, by God's power are being guarded through faith. So what is faith? Faith is God's power in you that guards you. You see that connection? You see that explanation? So the very belief that we have in Christ, the very faith that we have in Christ is by God's power. This is an explanation of grace. Grace is not only unmerited favor for the sinner, but it's God's very power within us to do what he's called us to do. Not only obey the gospel in the very outset of repentance and faith, but to live in that repentance and faith, to live for Christ as we are then alive in Christ. And so you got, we got to slow down and think through how these writers are writing it so that we understand more these implications on life and our belief. So who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So does that mean that we're not saved yet? Or that we don't know if we're saved yet? Here again, if, if we come across the word salvation, and this is an example, and we got to say, okay, what's the context? What is he talking about? What is being defined here? Because we can easily say, this is about salvation. You're not saved yet. You got to work up to that. Or we never know if we are until we die. That's why the Catholic Church believes that the, the greatest Protestant heresy is assurance of salvation. That you can know that you are saved. But God's word, isn't God clear right here? I sure hope you see that. So for salvation, this is the final piece of our salvation. This is, this is when that salvation is in glory, glorified, perfected as we come, as it's being be ready to be revealed in the last time. It's looking ahead to when that salvation is final, when we enter into glory with our Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's not, again, in, in, in coming to be saved. It's looking at that final end of our salvation in this life as we enter into glory. And that will be revealed in the last time. 
So how would you describe verses 3 through 5? I would say that this is gospel truth. Theological, rich, gospel truth about God's grace in Christ. This, he's explaining the gospel. He's explaining the gospel. And so when it says in verse 6, in this, in this, in what? When you come across the word this, what does that mean? What is that referring to? It's referring to everything that he said. So in this, in this great truth, God's doctrine of salvation in Christ, in that you rejoice. So there's a lot of the church that says doctrine, pff, nah, we don't need it. It's too high academic, it's too stale, it's too boring. No, it's not boring at all. In fact, we ought to rejoice in it. These believers did. And they, if we look at the historical context of when they were living, <laughs> that magnifies this idea of what rejoicing is in this truth because they were dealing with a lot, a lot. So in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, here again, a purpose statement of God, a purpose statement of God. If necessary, this glorifies the sovereignty of God, not only in salvation, but in the rest of the Christian life. If necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So God has a purpose for those trials. This is what we need to be seeing in our study of Scripture. And how will that affect your life? Maybe you will come to a day where you will know that you have cancer. Oh boy. Or you lose your job. Or whatever it may be, whatever trial it may be. This will anchor us in rejoicing in God's sovereign grace all the way through our life, knowing that He has a purpose for it, if necessary, no matter what. So, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that, another purpose statement, they're all over the place here. And we need to see them because it's building and building and building and building. It's building on gospel truth, then it goes and feeds into our life so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's a lot said right there. So, so that the tested genuineness of your faith. Here again, it uses the word faith. So we need to keep that in connection with what was said in verse 5. And ask the question again, how does Peter define faith? As Peter defines faith, that has to be fueling our understanding of what he's now saying. It's God's power. That's faith. God's power in us. So God's power, our faith that he produces within us, it's tested. The tested genuineness of your faith and notice here, more precious than gold that perishes. It's using that same word, but in the, in, in, in the negative. Here earlier was imperishable. Now it's the gold that perishes. He's, he's giving an example here and says that your faith isn't something that's going to perish. Why? Because it's rooted in God's grace. It's accomplished and produced by God alone. He's the one who does it. So he's the one who keeps it. He's the one who refines it. He's the one who tests it so that it shows that it's real. Not because of our strength, not because of our goodness, but because of him. He's the one who shows how good it is. And so he's it, it, this more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. There's a lot of imagery here that's all through Scripture that should help us live out our Christian life. The refining of fire, or the refining of gold, the dross being taken off so that pure gold can emerge. This is the process of God, and He's the one who does it and who accomplishes it. So that that faith can be found to rest in the praise, glory, and honor at the, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So may it happen or may it not? The, word, the use of the word may may kind of throw us off. Like, eh, I don't know if it'll happen. And that might drive us to, well, it's dependent upon me. But context. We've got to keep it 
in all of what's said already. And all of what's said is driving to the purpose and accomplishment of God's grace in us through Christ. So that when that day comes, that we stand before him, that we, that all of what he has done will be resulting in the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ to show what he's done, the glorious work of taking something that was so wretched and making it beautiful gold. That brings glory to him. Now, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible. Notice the, the, the double statement, rejoice with joy, magnifying this idea of rejoicing with joy, that it's inexpressible, that you can't fathom. And this is a product of God's grace in us to bring us to a place of, of horrible trial, tremendous struggle. And again, the historical context is so important to understand the magnification of that that then these people are rejoicing with a joy that is inexpressible. They can't, they can't describe it. They can't describe it. And all of what they're going through is, is just tremendous and how they can't describe it. And again, it's a testimony to God's grace, keeping his people. This is a great, great exposition of the, the per preserving grace of God, the perseverance of the saints, the keeping of God, the sovereign keeping of God. And so it's inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. So here again, it's looking at the finality of that, not the fact that you may never know that you have it or not. It's the finality of it, looking at that will happen. So I say this often, what's the one thing that can never, ever be taken from you if you are truly in Christ? Your salvation. Anything else, and we get a great picture of this with Job, anything else can be taken. But there's one thing that can never, ever be taken, and that's the life that you have in Christ. Why? Because you're so good and you hold it? Because you contributed when the time was right? Because you took advantage of God's grace instead of that person? That would bring glory to us, and that would put our work into salvation. So we need to see the implications of that. We need to ask honest questions, and if we are thinking anything else theologically at the root of this, and we come to see the truth of God, if we don't change our mind, then we are in disobedience and sinning against God. So we need to come to see God's glorious grace explained here and see how it is such an anchor for our life that guides us and leads us in every single trial. We are kept in God's hand. If we're in his hand, we're not going anywhere, no matter how shaky we feel. Because God's hand is not shakable. It's firm, immovable. So the outcome of your faith is this, just the eternal perspective that this inheritance is kept for those that God, in his foreknowledge, put his love upon before time began. That is grace. And this is a, a great explanation of grace. And so we've looked at purpose statements. We looked at phrases. We looked at various things to look out for. And again, taking time with God's word. Now, Go to Romans 10, and we'll maybe just go through the beginning part of this as time is flying by. Romans chapter 10, Paul comes into this and says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. So here's questions right away. What's the context? It's about salvation. It's about people who are not saved. And it's about prayers to God so that they may be saved. Those are some important questions that... that important insights that keep us looking at the context. 
of what's being said so that we're anchored in what God has said. So the prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Who? He's talking about his fellow Jews, right? And so he's going in, and here's the first question then. Why? Why? Look at the word for. The word for, I always say, and and I like to uh, change it with the word because. It's essentially what it's meaning in the Greek. The word for, in, in my contemporary mindset, I don't use very often. So it's a lot easier for me to connect, and this is why, to connect what Paul says. Notice how many times he uses the word for all throughout this. Paul does this a lot. And he's actually writing in an, an, an apologetic way, defending the faith, looking at the whole scope of, of the truth of God and, and arguing and building his argument. So now he keeps building. So we need to take the verse previous and then build on it and build on it and build on it as he explains it more and more. So why aren't they saved? That's the question. Why aren't they saved? Because I bear witness, I, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God but not according to knowledge. So here it gives us a more of a uh, examination of the reason of why they're not saved. They have a zeal. What zeal? It's a, com- uh, it's a passionate energy, right? An outward energy. And here it's merely just outward, but not according to knowledge. So they just didn't know doctrine. When scripture talks about knowledge, it's this intimate understanding that not only is in your head, but it's also in your heart and it affects your will. It affects all of your life. And so this knowledge is not just what they know or what they don't know, but also how that affects how they view all of life, especially their relationship with God as that is the context. So they have an outward zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They don't know the truth. Why? Because being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to the right, God's righteousness. So being ignorant, this shows us that it is more in a doctrinal framework, that that's where it's coming from. That's where it's coming from. Though it feeds the rest of their life, it affects them automatically. It's coming from their understanding of the righteousness of God. What does the righteousness of God mean? What does that phrase mean? Is it talking about an attribute of God? Or is it talking about the righteousness that comes from God in Christ? And so it's, it, it's the same phrase that is in uh, Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it... Because in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So this righteousness of God phrase, it's talking about the righteousness that comes from God. And what righteousness comes from God? It's an imputed righteousness. It's an alien righteousness that's not in ourselves. It doesn't come from within us. It comes from outside of us. It comes from God himself. And so this is the very heart of the gospel. Uh, it's, it's, it's revealing, declaring the imputed righteousness of Christ. Why? Because we are utterly unrighteous. We are dead inside. We have nothing to give God. And even our external righteousness is filthy rags to God. So nothing that we have that we can give to God. So in saying that, doesn't that describe the Pharisees? They think they have something, don't they? They think they have a goodness within them, right? That's, that, that's their whole system. That, that's what it, everything is rooted in and what their beliefs are. So being ignorant of this righteousness that comes from God, they seek to establish their own. And isn't that clear through the Gospels and other places? It's so clear that the Jews, in, in large part, they were establishing a righteousness that comes from within them. Obedient works that God would be pleased with. They did not submit to God's righteousness, God's way of being right. Now, what's God's way of being right? Here's the context that we need to keep together because, again, there weren't chapter breaks. So what does it say earlier in, uh, at the end of 
uh, Romans 9, starting in verse 30. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Why? Now this right there should feed into our understanding of Romans 10 as he gets into it. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. As if it were based on works. As if it were based on something that they could do. Human effort. In whatever capacity it is. If it's dependent upon them, it's human effort. Whether it's 1% or whether it's all. It doesn't matter. And they were pursuing it by works. They were ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God that's outside of us. And that God's very power produces a faith. In that, and gives us the clothing, uh, the, the, the imputed righteousness of Christ. And so they have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I am laying a, in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So again, that goes back to the righteousness of God that comes in Christ. The imputed righteousness of Christ from God that's outside of us. That needs to be at the core of us understanding what Paul is saying. And it's, again, the context is incredibly important. So then we go back to Romans 10. And seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Why? There again is the question we need to ask. Why? We're building, right? He's explaining more and more. Why? Because Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. To Jesus' obedience on our behalf. He lived that perfect life so that we could be right before God, right? So that we could be justified in the sight of God. So he obeyed the whole law in our place so that God could declare upon us and say that we are guiltless, that we are right, righteous, and we are only righteous in the righteousness of Christ. Do you see the connections? You see how it's bringing all of this together and explaining it more, driving it to the righteousness of Christ for all those who believe. Now here again, we need to be very careful to not pull that to everyone who believes. Oh, that automatically says that belief is on us. Keep it in context. Keep it in the context. Now here again, Christ is the righteous, end of the, right, of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Why? For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, That a person who does the commands shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down or who will descend into the abyss. That is to bring Christ up from the dead. So here again, the context of what is driving us into Romans 10 is that Romans 9, 30 through 33. So that's going to feed our understanding of what he's saying even further. Now, the, the, the reason why I pulled this one out is to really highlight how Paul builds and builds and builds and builds. And he keeps building. We won't keep going into it because I'm running out of time, but he keeps building. There's many more fours being used at the beginning of sentences. So you're asking why, why, why? And he keeps telling you, this is why, this is why, this is why. And he goes further into uh, just declaring where faith comes from. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So that needs to be connected all the way back to verses 9 through 10, 3 through 4, and the context at the end of Romans 9. And that chunk of Romans 10, 13 through 17 is a great, great reason of why we do evangelism in light of God's sovereignty. So here's an objection to the sovereignty of God in election. Well, if God is sovereign in election, he's got all mapped it out before the foundation of the world's all set, why go evangelize? Go read that, and it'll tell you why. Paul tells you why. Why? Because God uses wretched sinners like us who who he has made honorable vessels. He uses us to preach his word. And through that means, he then brings salvation to people. They then call on Christ. That's more reason to go. And that's all rooted in 
God's glorious and gracious grace. So, so faith comes from hearing, hearing, hearing the truth and hearing the, the outward, uh, the, the audible truth and the internal hearing of the word of Christ. Christ actually calling sinners, the ones that he has come for, that God has set apart in him. He's calling them and everyone that he calls for salvation, they will come. They will come. And so again, Hopefully this helps you kind of look for things that, uh, that, that are mindful in studying, that, could be, that, that need to be aware of, taking time and slowly going through Scripture. Um, we'll go through one more quickly. Uh, Philippians 4. Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. And then this is driving more at the application in life. God ex- exhorting us in all of the trials and, again, historical context. Who's writing this? Paul. Where is he? In jail. So he's going through some hard times, right? And so that's got to be in, in our mind when we're studying Scripture. So verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And if you didn't get that the first time, he says, again, I will say rejoice. Rejoice when things are good? No. And that's the context. Again, we need to keep in mind. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. So the Lord is at hand, coupled with do not be anxious about anything, need to be understood. Need to be understood that for one, anxiousness is warring against God's sovereignty. We don't like it. We want to be in control. We want the answers. We want to know all the unknowns. That's what anxiety is. We want control. But what does it say? Leading up to that, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. The Lord's in control. God is sovereign. He is reigning over all of it. Therefore, don't be anxious. Don't pull back control. Try to pull back control. And then when it's not going away or you don't understand, then you're going to be enveloped in anxiousness. We all do it. Why do we, should we not be anxious? Because God is sovereign. So this is calling us to not only theological implications, but life implications. Like God's sovereignty and our call to action are running full steam, and we need to have both of them in our hands, mindset wrapped around them so that we can trust, we can rest, and we can rejoice in an active way that is resting all in the truth of God, while we obey these commands. These are commands. Do not be anxious. So if I'm anxious, that's that's disobedience. If I'm perpetually just just giving in to this anxiousness because I want to know everything, because I want control, all of that, I don't want to give... All of that respect to the sovereignty of God. I don't want to acknowledge it. I don't want to believe it. I'm, I'm just fighting it. What does that say? It's disobedience, right? So we need to trust, rest, and rejoice that God is sovereign. And that calls us to action. Everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be known to God, right? God calls us to prayer. Prayer is... Declaring that you're utterly dependent upon God for everything, no matter what it is. And in that, we need to understand, again, his sovereignty, reigning all of it. And the peace of God, the peace that is possessed by God, that comes from God, and only him, which surpasses all understanding, we can't fully grasp it, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So a couple of references to write down here. The peace of God, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. 
It's one of my favorite benedictions that I give on Sundays that, that drives at the faithfulness of God. He gives us peace. He sanctifies us. He will fulfill it. He's faithful. All glory to him. He's the one who does it. That can help in my understanding here. Bringing along these other truths in Scripture to help study God's Word and magnify the importance and implications of it. And that will bring me to a place where I can't fully understand it. But in that, I'm going to rejoice because God is in control over everything, no matter what it is. And all, thi- all the things He works is for my own good because I've been called according to His purpose. So here again, I'm set in that life of being held in God's hands. He will guard my heart. He will guard my mind in Christ Jesus. So 1 Corinthians 2.16, we have the mind of Christ. Romans 12.2, that we need to be renewed in the mind so that we can know the perfect good will of God. In Ephesians 5, 15 and 15 through 17, so that I'm supposed to not live foolishly, but live wise, knowing the will of the Lord. So these are all, I need to have them in my study. So again, you got to take time with God's word. You got to use cross references. You got to use those tools that God has given us. Interpret in, uh, scripture, interpret scripture. And as we do that, as we use these, it magnifies the beauty and strength of God's word for us, to give us strength. Then he says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is anything, any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So that, keeps, that, that brings to mind Ephesians 5, 7 through 10, and I'll just read it real quick. Because as we use cross-references as a very good tool, we should see the connection and magnify. It says, therefore, do not be part- become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. So this, in whatever context it's in, in my own life, should drive me to not be enveloped in the news or in social media and have that deter my life or in anything else that will take us away. I need to be meditating on God's truth, on what is true, what is honorable, what is just, what is pure, lovely, and commendable, what is worthy of praise. And who defines those things? Man? So that again reiterates why the study of Scripture is so important and go slow with it. Take your time. Whatever you have learned and received and heard, just think about what that says. Here again, if you, if you come across these lists, these, you know, just category and, 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 and building on that, learned, received, heard, seen in me, we need to bring that together and see it for what it is in the context. And Paul, is, he says, follow my example, which is ultimately follow Christ and practice these things. Be diligent. You think of an Olympian. They didn't just get up off the couch and say, I want to be an Olympian one day, did they? No, years and years and years of practice. We're out on that field with 10-year-olds practicing soccer so that one day maybe they'll be in college or maybe you'll be on a professional team. Who knows? But you go out there to be deliberate in your practice, to go and intentionally do it and put all of your effort into it. Put all of your effort into it. And all through that, what does it say? And the God of peace will be with you. It's what we need. That's what we need, the God of peace. And in verse 7, the peace of God. Peace comes from God only. God's the one who owns it. God's the one who gives it. And he, that God of peace, will be with us, abiding with us, ministering to us as we say, God, I want you. I want to know you, to know your word, so that I can live faithfully glorifying you. You. 
That's what I want. So we take time with, our, with Scripture. Again, and this is why we're doing this class, because it's so important to have a good foundation for how to even approach Scripture. And let alone just not just be like our, 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 our society, especially the Christian church today, of just like, eh, I'll just get it done, do it quick, do it the way I want it, and I'm on with my life. I've got better things to do. So I'll ask you this, the knowledge of Christ, is there any other better knowledge to have? Learn anything in, the, in life. Is there anything better than the knowledge of Christ? And as we are anchored in that, wanting the knowledge of Christ and the excellency of the knowledge of Christ over all things, then whatever we learn in the earthly frame will be in proper priority, will be in a proper context to where that that we learn, whatever it is, and, and I was talking to Ethan the other day, I don't even know how to change a battery in a car. I don't even know cars. I'm so ignorant in cars, but there's other things that I do know. So all of that can glorify God. All of the things that we know in the earthly framework glorifies God when I am meditating on the truth of God and knowing that all things come from Him. All things come from Him. So with that, uh, before we pray, just... I, I want to, again, encourage you to take time. Use these resources. Use these principles that we're giving you, that we've learned ourselves by the grace of God, and put them into practice, and not only just nonchalantly, which isn't something you should do. You need to strive. Strive. And so I'll end with Thomas Brooks's quote again. Because I, I was reading about Jonathan Edwards, too, in his, in his resolves. He was wanting to be the best Christian that he could be. And you think to yourself, oh, that's so prideful. But is it? When you understand Jonathan Edwards, you will not think it's prideful at all. So we should want to be this, the, the, the wisest, strongest, best Christians that we can be. So remember, that is not hasty reading, but serious meditation on holy, heavenly truths that makes them prove sweet and profitable to the soul. It is not the mere touching of the flower by the bee that gathers honey, but her abiding for a time on the flower that draws out the sweet. It is not he that reads the most, but he that meditates most that will prove to be the choicest, sweetest, wisest, and strongest Christian. Let's pray.